How many of you have uh, never had dance lessons? Never taken any dance lessons? Okay. Well, you came on the right Sunday. Yeah, because in just a moment, we're going we're gonna to be teaching you how to dance. The, um, you need to know that when I was a young man, I went to a college in Indiana for two years. It was a Christian liberal arts college. It was called Grace College in Winona Lake, Indiana. It's a Grace Brethren College. It was a very strict college. Uh, and they had all kinds of rules against dancing. You could not dance off campus. You could not dance on campus. In fact, if you were faculty, you actually signed a statement saying that you would not dance with your spouse. Uh, they especially did not want married faculty to having sex standing up because they thought that could lead to dancing. And uh, <laughs> it was not until I, I can't believe I said that, but, uh, <laughs> but I did, so. I like to give the elders something every week where they have to seriously consider whether to fire me, but uh, yeah, they will be after that. But anyway, it was not until I actually switched colleges so that my junior year, I went to Covenant College in Tennessee, which was a Presbyterian uh, college. And that's where I learned that, you know, to dance was okay. And Holly and I, over the years, we've t we took some dance lessons. In fact, we took some dance lessons with some folks here 20 years ago. I mean, it was a long time, right? I remember we were given a little booklet that had some diagrams in it, you know, showing you where you could put your feet for things. And most of it, though, was just lessons that took place when we showed up. I still remember the basic steps to the waltz. Uh, it's got another name. It's called the box step. Have you heard of that? The box step. And uh, we, there are the steps on the screen. We can put them up there for you because you're going to need these here in a second. <laughs> and as you can see, when you do the box step, which also can be turned into the waltz, you kind of create a little box. That's why it's called the box step. Now, I'm gonna demonstrate this for you and I'm only gonna do this once, okay? So it, it kind of it, it goes like this. The box step is very simple. You just kind of plant your feet and then you step up and over and back and then back over. So it goes like this. One, two, three, Four. You see there's a little slide in there. It goes like this. You haven't seen anything yet. Let me get my shirt off. Yeah. yeah. It goes like this. It goes one, two, three, four. And you can turn and you can make it more fancy, you know, and you can get, you can put a lot of hip action into it. Anyway, you get the idea. Yeah. And, um, that's the basic step. Now you know how to dance. You know the basic step. You know where to put your feet. And that's all good. But what you don't know is how to dance with grace. Now, that takes a lot of practice, actually. Uh, you can do these steps with a certain mechanical, almost robotic type of an approach. You can plant your feet in the right place like the chart shows, but that doesn't mean you're dancing gracefully. And here's the deal. You can be a Christian and you can have the book and you can know the book and you can do the book. And I certainly hope you do do the book, the book that God has given us, this book called the Bible. But when you do it without grace, you do it not gracefully. Well, there's not much life or beauty, or maybe not even much goodness in it. In fact, if you know it and you do it without grace, your dance can, it can look and be very mechanical and almost robotic, and it can even look ugly. It can. Now, if you've ever danced with somebody who's a really good dancer, you know, I mean, they dance with a lot of grace you'll find that they actually make you a better dancer just to be around them and be with them. It's as if their grace spills over onto you and they are making you look good. My mother was a dancer like that. My mom was very graceful on a dance floor, fun to watch. On several occasions, I got to dance with my mom and that was a lot of fun. She was, I, I'm not exaggerating, it looked like she was just gliding across the floor. Very graceful very stylish. When she danced, she danced with a lot of pizzazz. 
It's fun to watch. And uh, that is very different than, say, getting a book, you know, on dancing that shows you the steps and memorizing the steps and then kind of mechanically putting your feet in the right place. Yeah, it's very different, very different. Now, I say all of that for this reason. A lot of times religious people have a similar kind of problem. Religion can produce people who know the book and do the book, but there's little or no grace in it. Uh, too often we end up producing, when we do that, rule followers instead of, instead of Jesus followers. Christians who are mechanical and unfeeling, maybe even kind of joyless in their lives, lifeless, fearful, possibly even judgmental, who end up mostly being known for what they are against, right? And then we wonder, why don't other people want to come to church and be like us? Well, that's why, you know. Now, Jesus knew all about this problem of religion. He knew that good people, good law-loving people could quickly become religious people. And when that happens, we go from good to bad to ugly kind of fast. So Jesus raised questions when he taught. In the Sermon on the Mount, kind of a subtext of the text itself is this question that Jesus asks. And the question is, who really is a good person? Really? What is it that makes someone a good person exactly? And these are critical questions to answer. They're important questions to ask. Now, next week, as we continue on in our study on the Sermon on the Mount, we start to learn from Jesus how to deal with some of the great human problems. Problem of anger. Anybody have that problem? Truth is, we all do. We all show it differently, process it differently. Problem of sexuality, the problem of stressed or broken relationships. Jesus is going to get into all those things with us. But before he does that, he first prepares us for that teaching that's about to come. And he does that by helping us get really clear about what it means to be a really good person. And this is what he says. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. He's talking about the Old Testament, the Torah, the teaching of God. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices, that's a good word, and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then there's this climactic statement right at the end of this, this this very important statement, he says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the, of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And you could say, and you'd be close to right, that the whole rest of Matthew from chapter five right on to the end is really unpacking that statement right there. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. I always used to think that was bad news. <laughs> I would read that verse and swallow hard, right? Because after all, the Pharisees were killing it religiously. Nobody could do the things that they did. Fast twice a week. Often they would memorize the entire Old Testament they would never miss a prayer time, never miss being in the right place at the right time. The Pharisees even had laws about women and where women could be, whether or not they could be in their presence. Their wife, of course, could be in their presence. Other women, no, not so much because they didn't want to be tempted to lust. So they were gonna make sure that problem couldn't happen by just not letting women get around them as much as possible. They had these really you could call them high bar standards. And I thought uh, that what Jesus was saying was, is that I have to clear an even higher bar than theirs or I'm not gonna get into heaven. But it turns out that's not what Jesus is saying here. 
Jesus is not saying these religious leaders had a, have a lot of righteousness of their own, but you need even more. That's, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, and we'll see this as we kind of study through this text, is they don't have righteousness at all. Not any real righteousness. One time Jesus was describing this group, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He described them this way. Imagine if he was describing, I mean, this is how he described them. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. You are like whitewashed tombs. Wow, the, the pictures that Jesus used here are disturbing if you think about it. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Jesus didn't make a lot of friends with teaching like that, especially among the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. In fact, he deeply offended these good, powerful people. That's who they were. They were good, powerful people. So understand, these religious leaders, these good, powerful people, they defined a good person in terms of external compliance to the law, right? To the Torah. They defined a good person as somebody who does the right things and avoids doing the wrong things. Somebody who follows the rules, if you will. St. Augustine, a few centuries later, had a wonderful phrase for this. He talked about what he called glittering vices. That was the phrase he used, glittering vices. A glittering vice is a quality that it looks like a virtue. It's, it's a good thing, like memorizing the, the Old Testament. Would that be a good thing for you to do? Yeah. Uh, or daily prayer, you know, practicing rigorous discipline in the matter of daily prayers or serving other people. But glit it becomes, these good things become glittering vices when we sort of find our identity in them, when we sort of think that others ought to notice us doing these things. When, we sort of, when I come to my small group and I'm quoting as much of the Old Testament as I always, always can, because did you know I've memorized the entire Old Testament and I want you to know. A glittering vice. Glittering vices can be so harmful in the human soul, they can make me not love you. And they can make me just want you to love me and be impressed with me. Winston Churchill, one of my favorite individuals to read about, uh, prime minister of England at one point, uh, he had a political rival named Stafford Cripps. Some of you might know this story. Cripps was a brilliant member of parliament. Uh, not too many people liked him though. He was, a, he was a very austere kind of character, very disciplined, very rigorous, also very self-righteous, quite disapproving of others. He's what Mark Twain used to call a good man in the worst sense of the word. <laughs> well, Cripps, uh, one known vice was that he loved smoking cigars. Uh, but eventually he even gave that up, that one known vice, right? And when Churchill heard about that, he said, too bad. Those cigars were his last contact with humanity. <laughs> See, a lot of things that are good in themselves, like I would suppose quitting smoking cigars might be good for you, but they can become glittering vices because Cripps is an example of someone who when he quit, he thought everybody else needed to quit, yeah, if they were gonna be as good as him. Glittering vices. I can, I can believe correct doctrine. I can memorize the entire New Testament. After all, it's shorter than the old. I can avoid pornography religiously. I can have a great work ethic and devote my life, my entire life to work. I can, I can fast once a week. I can do what the law says. I can do good things, but it is possible to focus so much on doing the good things, the right things, following the rules that I fail to become the right person. This can happen. It's like doing the dance steps with no grace, doing the dance steps with no pizzazz whatsoever. Now I wonder, just gonna ask you to think about this as we kind of progress in our thinking this morning. 
Do you have any glittering vices? Good things you do that you're kind of proud of, if you're being honest, and you kind of do like it if others notice the good stuff you do. Do you have any glittering vices? I know I do. I'm not going to tell you what they are, but I do. <laughs> and these glittering vices, they're, they're really very much about focusing on external compliance and not focusing on, at the same time, or even more so, the reconditioning, the transformation of my heart. I asked a highway patrol officer one time, what do officers look for when they pull somebody over on the road? And, uh, and this officer told me, and I would love to tell you, but I'd have to kill you if I did. I've never gotten a ticket since they told me this. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you what he didn't say. Here's what this officer didn't say. He didn't say, we're looking for people whose hearts are not in it. He didn't say, we're looking for people who obey the speed limit, but they're doing so with a grudging spirit and a lack of joyful, wholehearted commitment. He didn't say that. And he didn't say that because they don't care about your heart, not one bit. They just want outward compliance. That's all they can deal with. That's all they can really judge. That's all they can see. But know this, God is different. God wants a transformed heart. That's his intent in our lives with every disciple. He wants a transformed heart. So anytime you're reading the Bible and Jesus talks about the righteousness of the Pharisees, you kind of have to put that word righteousness in quotes because their rule following orientation is not coming from a place of love and appreciation for who God is. On the contrary, it's coming from a place of trying to earn his love and appreciation because of who they are, because of what they're doing. You see the difference? It's the exact opposite. And that is the essence of religion, really. Earning one's place of blessedness, religion. Achieving nirvana, religion. Climbing the reincarnation ladder, religion. Being good enough is always about religion. What this produces in us is sometimes too, a lot of resentment around, you know what? How much I'm sacrificing, how much I'm doing, how good I'm being, how often and how well I serve, how faithfully I follow the rules. And really, as I do all that, there's this back resentment. And I really want you to notice and be impressed by my religious efforts. That's what religion will do to people. And ironically, it just kind of feeds this thing of pride and arrogance in us doing religion. And a tragic result of all this is that really religious people tend to give righteousness a bad name. Let me explain. You see, in our culture, we have a great problem. The New Testament uses these wonderful, really attractive words to describe goodness, life in the kingdom, you know. Uh, but these words have all taken on baggage in our day so that today these words don't sound even desirable to us. They're kind of oppressive when we hear them. Imagine you're going on a blind date and you ask the person who set you up, well, what is he, what is she like? Tell me what they're like. And they say, well, she is really sanctified. <laughs> She's really holy. She's really saintly. She's, she's really righteous. And you're like, Oh, you mean like a righteous babe? No, no, I just mean righteous. You see, most people are not drawn to these words anymore. And that is very sad because those words, man, they represent great ideas, good ideas. Back in Jesus' day, people would hear Jesus teach and some of the people listening to Jesus were a little bit confused sometimes by what he was saying. And some thought that because he was criticizing the righteousness of the Pharisees, that maybe what he was really saying is, hey, rules don't matter. Law, the law of God doesn't matter. The rules are stupid. The rules can be ignored. We don't need to keep these rules. And something in us, if we're honest, actually likes a message like that. But that's not what Jesus was saying. In fact, he taught that the rules, the law of God, it, they, these things are actually good for us, good for our spirits, good for our soul. Just a little aside here. 
Deep down, we know this to be true. Every human being, even the atheist, knows that the law of God really is good for us. We know this. I'll give you some examples. How many here want to marry a rule breaker? You know, somebody who breaks the law. Somebody who, yeah, they don't pay their taxes. They, they uh, steal money. They completely disregard the promises they've made to you. How many here want to marry that person? Yeah, me either. Uh, do you want to work for a rule breaker? You know, somebody that doesn't pay their employees when they're owing them money. You know, somebody that doesn't follow the law. That business is going to get shut down. Do you want to work for a rule breaker? How many want to raise a little rule breaker? And <laughs> yeah, we're all trying not to do that, right? <laughs> when we're parenting. Is that the key to righteousness? Is that the key to the blessed life, the good life? You know, when you're undergoing brain surgery, and I hope you never do, but when you're undergoing brain surgery, do you want a neurosurgeon who broke all the rules at school, never showed up for class, cheated on all their tests, and are saying to you as you go under, wish me luck? Is that who you want? (laughs) I don't think so. I hope the point is obvious. We know deep down that rule breaking isn't the way to a truly righteous, a truly blessed, a truly rich and satisfying life. It just isn't. And that's why Jesus starts this section of his teaching by saying, do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. Jesus says that because, he says that because since he had critiqued the righteousness, you see, of the Pharisees, some people were thinking that maybe he was trying to just abolish the law and the prophets. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. Don't think that. That's not at all what I am saying. And that's what he means when he says, not the smallest letter not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. The law needs to be accomplished, fully accomplished, fully lived out. And here's the deal. The law rightly understood and fulfilled is the greatest gift God has ever given to human, the human race, except Jesus himself, of course. And we all need to know this. The law points us toward righteousness. It points us toward blessedness. It points us towards living a good life. That word righteousness is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful word. So wonderful, it needs to be rescued in our day. Centuries before Jesus, the philosopher Plato wrote in uh, the book that we call The Republic, he wrote about the good life as, you know, a Greek philosopher saw it. You know, and he describes what is the good life and what does that look like? And he used a word to describe that life. That old Greek word that he used was dikaiosune, righteousness, we translate it. Righteousness. That was the word he used. Later on, when the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek, the Greek word chosen to translate the idea of the good life the life of shalom, the life of peace, the rich, good, deep, joyful, satisfying life, the life that God desires for every single one of us, the word they used to describe that, that life was dikaiosune, righteousness, the righteous life. And so the point is the law of God rightly understood and, and humbly studied and humbly practiced through the power of the spirit is a gift of God to the human race. It guides us, it checks us, it keeps us on track, on the path to the good life, the blessed life. The psalmist writes about this. It refers to the law as the ordinances of God and says that those ordinances are more precious than gold and sweeter than honey. That's what the psalmist said. The psalmist is right. You see, God's law is not about following rules. God's law is about following Jesus, living the way Jesus lives. So when we break God's law, understand what we're really doing is we're breaking with Jesus. We're saying, I'm not going to live the way Jesus lived, just not going to do it. Jesus says to us in this very sermon that we're studying, and we'll get to this soon. He says, seek first the kingdom of God. And that is a disciple's number one priority, seeking first the kingdom of God. It's the same as saying seeking first Jesus. But then he adds, and his righteousness. You have to understand these two things go together seamlessly. Seeking first the kingdom of God is seeking the righteousness of God. Righteousness is simply what your life looks like when you're living in the reality of the kingdom of Jesus, 
You're aware that you're a kingdom citizen. You're in his kingdom. His kingdom rules over all the other kingdoms. When you're living the good life, the blessed life, you're living in the kingdom of Jesus. And of course, the goal of your life is not rule following. The goal of your life is not sin avoidance. It's fullness of life. It's abundance of living. That's the only way to live in the kingdom. It's, friends, it's dancing with grace, don't you see? With pizzazz. It's having life and having it abundantly. Jesus did not say, I have come that you might avoid sin and avoid it with gritted teeth. That's not what he said. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Have it abundantly, you see. And I'll tell you, the failure to do this, the failure to attain a deeply satisfying, deeply abundant life will always lead you to the place where temptation looks really good because you're coming from a place of lack of satisfaction. You're not finding your satisfaction where you should. And eventually you'll sin. You'll give in. The only way to fulfill the law is to live in the abundance, in the grace of the kingdom of Jesus with the presence of Jesus who died on a cross to forgive us, who rose again from the dead to give us hope even in the most desperate of situations. So this week, here's my challenge to you. Don't be a rule follower. Don't be a rule breaker. Live in the abundance of Jesus' kingdom and practice what Jesus talked about, surpassing righteousness, a righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Practice surpassing righteousness. This week, don't just give outward compliance, uh, but out of the abundance of the kingdom of God with the presence of Jesus and his spirit in your life, with his power, with his strength in our midst, let's love and let's let love and joy flow out of us toward others in abundance. This week, when you're at home or at work or at school, wherever you might be, instead of doing the minimum you need in order to avoid trouble with your trouble with your spouse or your roommate or your siblings or your parents or your coworker or your boss or whatever, instead step into the kingdom, live in the abundance of Jesus' kingdom, offer surpassing righteousness. Yesterday, we did the day of service, right? Normally, my Saturday is kind of are structured along these lines. I get up in the morning, you know, get a cup of coffee. I go to work on these sermons and try to polish them off, you know, get, get them completely done and ready to roll. Uh, Saturday afternoon, uh, Holly and I will clean the church here. Saturday evening, uh, we, we like to just kind of slow down, relax, go to bed early. At least that's what I like to do. Now, this Saturday, however, was different. This Saturday, we had the morning of serving. So we get here, you know, got here about 8.30 and then we served, then we had lunch, you know, that went until like one-ish or something like that. Then we had a birthday party for one of our grandchildren. And that went for a couple hours, two, three hours. And then we came back to clean the church. And then we had another birthday party to go to for a good friend of ours. Didn't get home to about 8.30, something like that, quarter till nine. And so I didn't get to finishing this sermon until last night. So my temptation in all of this was just to resent all of that because this is not how I like my kingdom to run. This isn't the schedule I want for my kingdom, you see. Even though I know that everything we did yesterday was exactly what Jesus wanted us to do. Those were the right things for us to do. Now, here's the thing. Fortunately, I saw all this coming early. And so I decided early on uh, that I was going to live in the reality of Jesus' kingdom yesterday. I was not going to walk around all day long resenting all the good that I was doing, right? So I started praying, God, help me. Help me. My time really is your time. It's, it doesn't belong to me to start with. And in your kingdom, you have all the time I need. So I don't need to be rushed. I don't need to be preoccupied with my agenda, you know, my kingdom. I can relax. I can do what you want me to do. At the end of the day, if this sermon sucks, so what? It's your fault, Jesus. That's, a, <laughs> that's how I ended that prayer. Um, but seriously, I, I share that to say this. This is what it means to live in Jesus' kingdom. This is why obeying Jesus is impossible if I'm not living in the reality of his kingdom instead of living out of my own, yeah? You see, in his kingdom, I can love whoever needs to be loved. 
whenever he needs me to love them. Yeah, I can serve whoever needs to be served. I can do all the good God wants me to do and I can do it joyfully if I'm living out of his kingdom. You think about this. You all know the story of the Good Samaritan, right? The difference between the Good Samaritan, you know, the guy who does the will of God and helps the person who's hurt and dying alongside the road there, the difference between that Good Samaritan and the religious leaders who didn't help. You know, the religious leaders had a sermon to get done. You know, that, that's why they were in a hurry and that's why they had no time to help this guy. The difference though was that the good Samaritan was willing to be interrupted. He had time. His time was God's time. You could say he was living out of the kingdom. Oh, a person who has a need. I can meet that need. So again, here's the challenge. When you're at work this week doing whatever you do, don't just grudgingly follow the rules. Don't be a clock punching, you know, rule following conformist. This week at home, work, school, in the neighborhood, wherever it is you do your thing, step into, deliberately step into, become aware of Jesus' kingdom. Offer surpassing righteousness. So whatever you're doing, entering data, teaching students, selling products, writing code, caring for a patient, raising children, whatever it is you do, do it with surpassing righteousness. When you talk to somebody, listen well, encourage them, love them, do it with surpassing righteousness. This week, if you're driving a car, if you're blessed enough to have a car to start with, you know, slow down, be grateful you have a car and be a gracious driver. Let somebody in front of you, let them merge in front of you graciously, lovingly, caring the offer surpassing righteousness. This week, offer surpassing righteousness with your money. Be sensitive to the needs of others, the people around you. Is there any way that you can meet a need of theirs in the name of Jesus? Help them if you can. This week, let's practice living in the abundance of Jesus' kingdom with our time and with our energy and with our wisdom, if we have any, and with our resources. So that in the process of doing the things we do, we're actually offering up a surpassing righteousness. If you've been a rule follower, grinding it out, let me tell you, there's a better way. If you've been a rule breaker, just flouting the law of God, well, let me tell you, there's a better way. Remember, if you're a follower of Jesus, the aim is not behavior modification. Jesus put this distinction like this. He said, he said out of the flow, overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. In other words, my aim must not be just to say good things and avoid saying bad things. My aim is to have God change the automatic flow of thoughts and desires inside me to make that flow of thoughts and desires be truthful and humble and generous and thoughtful and hopeful and faithful so that good words naturally come out of a good place, a good heart, a heart that's always being changed and transformed by Jesus, by his spirit, by his law. So the question, how do I get my heart to change? This is the big question right here. How do I store up good things in my heart so that my heart changes? Well, I have a, I have a very secret answer for you. I'm only gonna share it with you. I don't want you to tell anybody else about this or our, you know, our jig will be up. Everybody will know, you know, the secret to Christianity. The way we get our heart to change is by something called, it's, this is really cool, the ordinary means of grace. There you go, wow. The ordinary means of grace. In other words, God has given us exactly what we need, the exact tools that are needed for heart change, heart transplants, spiritually speaking. And these are three things, very simple. The first is word, the word of God, the Bible. The second are the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And the third is prayer. Can we say this together? We're gonna say wow together. One, two, three, wow. wow. Yeah. We tend to underestimate the power of all three of these things. You know, when it comes to the word, one of the things you're doing right now is you're listening to it being taught. Maybe poorly, but you're still listening to it being taught. That helps you and me grow. 
That actually changes. It's one of the tools that changes the human heart to hear the scriptures read, explained, taught, and applied. That's one of the things that changes us. We need to read it ourselves. We need to think about the word of God and maybe we need to memorize it. That too is a wonderful thing that we can do to take the word of God and put it in here and have it affect and change and transform our heart. uh, The apostle Paul, not Jesus, the apostle Paul said this to a young man in the ministry one time. He said, until I come, until I get to your city, he said, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture. They didn't have their own copies of the Bible. So the public reading of scripture was essential for them to even know it or hear it. He said, devote yourself to preaching and to teaching. These things were critically important back then and they are still critically important today. Uh, Also a second thing, word sacrament. Right here on this table, what we do when we come to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is the first thing we do is we remember together. Remember what? We remember what Jesus did. We remember where Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's our advocate there. And we just celebrate this and we just live in this and we remind ourselves of it and we recommit ourselves to Jesus when we come to this table. We receive grace and we do it with a thankful, grateful heart. Or if not, we confess that to him and we seek forgiveness. And then the last thing is prayer. You know, this morning we are actually inaugurating a team of prayers here at Deer Creek Church. We have a team that now every Sunday, not just on communion Sundays, every Sunday, they're gonna be up here in purple vests. Well, we, we bought them some sequin vests that light up vests. We don't have them yet. So you're gonna have to look more closely, but they have purple vests and they're just up here to pray with you about anything. You don't, your life doesn't have to be in crisis to seek prayer. We have people up here that wanna pray with you after every service now to just help you embrace and walk into the kingdom of Jesus in any and every situation. A prayer, in case you don't know it, changes things. We're actually gonna study prayer not too long from now as we get further into the Sermon on the Mount. But doing these things, word, sacrament, and prayer by faith, in trust, with gratitude is how God will work in me and you. It's how our hearts will change. It's how we learn to live in the abundance of Jesus' kingdom. It's how we learn to do the dance with gracefulness.